Welcome back, everybody. This is part three of a three-part series of me positively reviewing April Wilkerson's three-part series on how she builds a board on board fence. If you haven't watched the first two videos, I'd recommend you go start there or else this third video probably isn't going to make a lot of sense. But once you have watched those videos, let's get into this one. It is 6.30 in the morning, but in Texas, this is the best time of day to get going. That's absolutely right. I mean, we're not in Texas, but in the summertime, the earlier you get started, the better. Our guys will usually meet up at the shop around 5.30 so that they can leave by 6.00 get by the supply house and get on property just as early as possible to avoid heat of the day. If you missed part one or part two of the fence building series, and I have left you links to both in the description below. This week I got started on building the boxes that will go around the steel post. And to do this, I am gonna be using three pickets per post. Now the brackets used to hold the panels to the post actually will extend past the width of the boxes that I'm gonna be building. So the first thing I did was grab some brown spray paint and paint all of the brackets. And to make this step a little bit easier, I cut out a template out of some cardboard. That's definitely a nice touch. That way the brackets blend in with the fence. Uh, so if you're a distance away, you don't really see them unless you're looking for them. Now we were thinking of a few different ways on how to attach the pickets to the steel post. So I'll stop here and just say, uh, now granted, these posts were already set. She didn't have a choice in the matter. I like using, this is one of the reasons I like using a purpose-built steel post, uh, such as the Postmaster by Maristar or Master Halco, the Lifetime post, uh, I think they're by Gregor. There's several manufacturers of purpose-built posts. Uh, the main thing is that you don't have to build these boxes. Uh, they're actually built into the fence and so really it's just a cover picket rather than a box but like i said april is, is playing with the hand she's dealt and we decided to use self-tapping screws to go directly into the side however it was way too much of a bear to try to drive in the screws with without pre-drilling first so i would hold the picket in place pre-drill through the wood and make a mark on the steel post on where the screw needed to go in then i would set the picket aside finish drilling the hole then set the picket back into place and drive in the self-tapping screw this method was a little time consuming, but it definitely worked well. The picket felt rock steady on that post. After I got done with one side, I would repeat for the other. To finish the box off, I came back with a third picket. I used something flat, a speed square in my case, to make sure that it was in line with the two side pickets. Then I used a little bit of construction adhesive and my brad nailer to attach it permanently. Yeah, so that's a good point. Uh, when you're dealing with a really thin surface, so she's affixing these these pickets perpendicularly so that she's only got a small surface uh, to nail into. So she used the wood adhesive to add just another layer of bonding between these pickets. Great idea. The next thing I got started on was cutting all of the top caps to go on top of each box. And I set up a stop block at the miter so I can make these repetitive cuts go quickly. Then I turned my miter to 45 degrees and cut off what will be the front two corners. To make sure that they all came out identical, I would line up the two by eight corner with the edge of my modder saw fence before making the cut. Hey, what, I like all the tools April has. She seems to have the right tool for every task. Uh, this is exactly the tool you'd want. Then I was able to start attaching it to the boxes. And to attach it to the box, I'm gonna be toenailing in two screws on the top side since you won't ever be able to see the top. And to make this step easier, I would first pre-drill the hole. This makes it easier not only to run in the screw, but also prevents cracking. Feels good. So next I started adding the trim, which is of course completely customizable. I have quite a few pickets left over that didn't make the cut for going on the fence because of things like this or things like this. So I'm gonna use these to make the trim for the posts. So I would use just a few dabs of construction adhesive and then my brad nailer to attach them. And since all of the boxes are the same measurement, you can set up a stop block at the modder saw and make a huge stack of each cut. That way you can very quickly just throw on each piece as needed. I would start off by adding the back trim, which is a little bit taller, and then come back and add the top trim, which is a little bit short. That's definitely a nice feature. You know, that added trim gives it that a little bit extra piece of, you know, the fine finishing touch. Ah, I like that a lot. She's probably going to come through and restain uh, that those exposed edges that you see there that aren't stained yet. And of course, just my opinion, but I think that these three components give all of the boxes a bold, but I don't know, an elegant look. 
Cody's brother was cool enough to come give us a hand for the day, so we divided it and conquered. Cody would go through and attach the two side pickets to the steel post. Willie would come back and add that front picket on, and then I would come back and do the top captain trim. Teamwork makes the dream work. You know, that's why we like using uh, three to four man crews. Uh, there's a lot of fence companies that prefer two man crews. Uh, and that, that extra one to two guys on a crew really helps just get things done that much quicker. That extra set of hands sometimes makes all the difference in the world. So the last thing I'm gonna be doing for these boxes is going through and applying a, a product called Fence Armor. This is just a small, low profile metal bracket that slips onto the bottom of the post to protect it from getting eaten up from a weed eater. I like this a lot. So we found Fence Armor right around the time, unfortunately, that we were phasing out wood post. You know, we use steel posts exclusively now. Um, but this fence armor is an incredible product. So she's probably going to explain it. Um, I'll, well, let's see if she ex explains exactly what it is, and then we'll come back. It connects to the post with just one simple screw, and this way we can come through here and not worry about the, the wood on the post boxes getting chewed up over time. Now, of course, I went with brown since I have a brown stand on mine, but they do come in all different sorts of styles and colors. So if you're interested, I'll leave you a link below. Yeah, so what they are, it's... Uh, it's Typically, I, they have different versions, I guess, but typically thin aluminum, so it's not big and chunky. It's not heavy. Um, that style that she had affixed with one screw at the face, there's other models that have uh, two screws, one on either side. Uh, but basically, if you have wood posts or like she had a box around her post, uh, they really do a great job of making sure that, as she demonstrated, that weed eaters don't over time really chew that post or the box up. Okay, moving on to the final step, building a gate. The first thing I did was grab the two by fours and cut the four joints that will make up the frame. Now I decided to use half lap joints just because of the strength that they give. Now, since I have a table saw and a dado stack, that's how I cut in the half laps. However, if you don't have these tools, like I said, she has every tool for what she needs. This is uh, her shop is bound to be incredibly awesome. Then you could also do this joint with a circular saw and a chisel. And I'll leave you a link in the description below where you can see an example of that. To attach these joints together, I'm using Type Bond 3 since it is rated for outdoor use. So this will be this will probably be the one area that I disagree with April on is making the gate outside the frame. Um, I would prefer to see that gate get built on on the fence being built as part of the fence. Um, just building it on a outside of the frame of the fence, outside off the structure of the fence, really. It leaves, for the DIY crowd out there, really leaves a lot of chance for the measurement being a little bit off. Now, obviously, April, she seems to be very skilled at woodworking, so I'm sure this gate's going to work out really well. Uh, but I would, for the DIY crowd, someone just getting into building fence, I would absolutely build that gate on the fence as part of the fence, apply your hinges, and then cut it loose, um, just so you know it fits exactly right. Uh, but... But if you're going to build a fence on the ground, April is absolutely doing that part of it correctly. And then four screws per joint. I also use these right angle jigs just to make sure the corners were nice and square before actually attaching it. So this diagonal support is really important because what it does is it transfers the load from the top unhinged corner to the bottom hinge corner. So before setting this, uh, the support in place, get the orientation of what's going to be the top and bottom of the frame and then also what's going to be the hinged and unhinged side. By running this diagonal member correctly, it'll prevent sagging over time. Now the only reason I'm using a 2x6 for my diagonal here is because I ran out of 2x4s. To attach it to the frame, I use glue and three nails per side. Once again, just pre-drilling these to make it a little easier. If you have a pocket hole jig, you could also use that. Now, when building out this side of the fence, we left the top cap as one solid unit so that we could attach the frame to the top cap and not have to continuously wrestle with it to finish out this side. But you can see I can, I can remove the clamp and it's now set in place. I ended up attaching some center horizontal members so that later, whenever attaching the hinges, I would have some good meat to go into. 
Okay, so a small hiccup. I mean, just a lesson learned since this is the first time doing a fence. But whenever building this section out, it would have been much smarter to start here and work our way that way. Instead, we built up to this point and then now we're trying to fill it in and it's just not lining up. So we're having to do what we can in order to make it look seamless. And to do that, I ended up just having to fudge the placement of the pickets and break from the standard spacing that I had been using. Yeah, so April kind of ran into a really common hiccup there that, and so she didn't start at her gate opening and then go towards the corners or to the house. But honestly, so she would have been correct to do it that way, start at the gates, then move out. But one way or the other, she's going to have to fudge that opening or that spacing somewhere. So at this part, she did it at the gate. If she had started at the gate, she would have had to do it by the house. It would have had to get done one way or the other, um, but she's right. You'd want to start at the gate and then work your way out. So I ended up fudging a few pickets right here on the left, but then spacing normal across the span of the gate and then fudging just slightly on the right. So some of the spacing directly to the left and right is a little bit narrower, but really after everything was said and done, I think it's one of those things that if you're not really looking for it, then you don't notice it. And I'm pretty happy with the way that it turned out. Okay, now on to mounting the hinges. Now these hinges are attached using lag bolts and they need good meat to go into, but some of the holes fell on the space in between pickets. So we traced out the hinges on a picket and then cut it out using a bandsaw. You could also use a jigsaw and then attached it to the fence right underneath the hinge. I like that a lot. So that way she's going, she has plenty of support behind the bracket to run that lag through but she's cut it to where it matches that bracket exactly. That way from, from the street, from the outside perspective, you don't see it at all. Uh, that is a great, uh, that's a great eye. Okay, almost done. Now at this point, the gate still is just one solid wall. So I moved up to the top with the circular saw and made one diagonal cut in order to break it loose. Now, even with that one cut done, the gate still won't open freely because the top cap interferes. So two relief cuts over on the hinge side need to be made so that it has a, the ability to swing all the way open. I used a circular saw to cut out the bulk of the material for these relief cuts, then used my multi-tool to cut out the remainder. Okay, now at this point, the gate should open freely. <sighs> that is a sigh of relief. So I'm calling this project a wrap. This was a really fun but huge project. None of the steps are technically difficult. It's just the sheer size of the project that makes it difficult. So my advice to you, if you're looking to replace your fence, is to schedule it out to where you can take your time with the project and not get overwhelmed with the process. Now, I do have a full cost breakdown of the entire project on my website, and I'll link to my website, the tools I use, the materials are all in the, the description below for you. So I hope that you enjoyed this three-part series, and I will see you the next time I'm working on something. Yeah, so guys, April did a great job on this fence. Um, one thing I did notice as we're wrapping this up in this final shot, uh, so it doesn't look like stain was applied at the edges that were trimmed. Uh, she probably went and followed up after the video and, and got those stained, I would think. But if you're using, so what it looks like is the contractor that stained and probably used a water-based stain which stays right on the surface. An oil-based stain would have uh, penetrated and soaked through the board. Uh, but any exposed surface where you see that lighter edge, the part of the board that's unstained, you'd want to follow that up with uh, getting some additional stain from whoever pre-stained the board and, uh, and follow that up with adding some more stain there. Make sure all the surfaces that are exposed to the elements are uh, stained and sealed. Uh, but, well, guys, I'll tell you what, so this is the final video – April did a great job. You know, she had a great point that she gave herself enough time to take her time with the project. You know, if I were doing this fence for the first time and I didn't have really much of an idea of what I was doing, but I was watching some videos and figuring it out, I would probably be best off to take whatever time frame I think it's going to take and then double it that, because little things are going to come up. So April mentioned in the first video that she had to go rent a generator to run her welder. Well, that takes time. You know, running to the rental store, filling out the rental agreement, getting it loaded, coming back. I bet that took her probably a quarter of a day to a half a day that she didn't really account for. There's little hiccups like that that come up throughout the project. In all honesty, we build these fins as a profession, and we still allow ourselves typically 10 to 15% more time on a project just as buffer. 
something's always going to go wrong. We're going to hit rocks or just any sort of unforeseen obstacles are going to come up. And if we don't plan to take additional time, we're going to run out of time and then we're going to end up having to push other projects off. So, uh, yeah, great piece of advice from April to take your time, plan, try plan for taking longer than you initially think, uh, but take your time with it. There's not a lot of this that's really tricky. There's not a lot of it that really can trip you up as long as you take your time, use attention to detail, stand back, take a look at it from time to time, make sure everything checks out. You know, altogether, her fence looks great. She did a great job on it. Uh, if you're not familiar with April, I would suggest going and subscribing to her channel. I've already done that. Uh, I'm really interested to see what else uh, what else she's up to. But for now, guys, I'm Joe Everest, the fence expert, reminding you that good fences make good neighbors.